Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Jazakwa khair. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening for this webinar on Nightingale Mosques hosted by the British Islamic Medical Association with Dr. Muhammad Jiva, who will be presenting the Mashad Ghosia Community Mosque Support Facility uh, and how they're trying to take pressure off the NHS by setting up a local healthcare facility. My name is Dr. Salman Okar. I'm the General Secretary of the British Islamic Medical Association, and I will be uh, introducing Dr. Jiva, who will be presenting uh, a short uh, summary and background to the project. And we will then proceed for a question and answer session. And then we will hopefully wrap up within about 30 to 45 minutes, inshallah. So uh, Dr. Jiva is a GP uh, at the Peterloo Medical Center in Middleton, and is also a member of the local uh, medical committee. He's also uh, part of the British Hajj delegation, which sends uh, UK trained doctors to uh, Mecca and Mina to provide uh, health services to the Hajjaj uh, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, this evening, he will be talking about the Mashad Wosia support. And uh, Dr. Jiva, I'd like to now hand over to you, please. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. As you say, I'm a GP. I've been a full-time GP for about 21 years now. And I'm also the chief exec for the Rochelle and Berry Local Medical Committee, as well as chairing the GP Federation in our borough. So I have some background in medical politics, as well as uh, clinical medicine. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I was invited by our local community mosque, the area that I grew up in, to ask for advice on what should the mosque be what precautions should the mosque be taking in light of COVID-19 and at the time we had a discussion with the mosque committee and advised regarding the age of the imams and what precautions they need to take and those that have long-term conditions and those precautions were put into place and then the following week the committee asked for another meeting at which point I suggested that we're not far off from a national lockdown based on the spread of the virus across the country. The Mosque Committee agreed that it was time to have a lockdown and their decision was to make an announcement after each Salah the following day that the following subsequent day the Mosque would then be closed and Alhamdulillah within 24 hours the government announced nationally that the country is now on lockdown so the Mosque was 24 hours ahead of the government. Now knowing the way that the virus has spread from the Far East across various continents to the UK and the way other countries are currently struggling and dealing with coronavirus, it was apparent that this wasn't something that's going to be coming and going in a matter of weeks and it is going to be something that's going to be with us for many months to come and will have significant impact on communities across the country. Um, all faiths, all ages. So at the time when I met the Mosque Committee and the Mosque Committee agreed to have a lockdown within 48 hours, I asked the question of whether there's something the Mosque could do to serve their community through what is going to be a very difficult time. They asked, what could we do? And I said, well, the biggest challenge we're going to have is around healthcare and looking at how other countries are struggling with hospital services and lack of capacity especially of um, itu beds it's highly likely that this country is going to suffer similar challenges if not worse because other countries had implemented lockdown a lot sooner than the uk and as most of you will be aware there's been an ongoing issue around ppe for clinicians the adequacy of it and the availability of it and therefore things have spread uh, quicker than uh, in other countries. So I asked the question of whether we can do something to serve the community. The mosque committee straight away agreed that it was a good idea to serve the community rather than leave the mosque in effect barren for a period of six to 12 months. I then invited a couple of my colleagues, one who's a hospital consultant and one who leads the out of our service. And the three of us met on site. And Alhamdulillah, the mosque has got quite a large hall 
attached to the mosque where they have wedding functions and community uh, events, including five-side football for the children. So we looked at it and we concluded that the cohort of the population that's going to struggle or is going to have difficulty accessing, accessing mainstream healthcare is going to be our older generation and those that are of end of life. Um, clearly the hospitals are going to have to make and are already making very difficult decisions on who is admitted into hospital and who has to be turned away based on their age and comorbidities. So we decided that it'd be great if we could look at the end of life uh, cohort as um, a population that we could serve within the mosque. Um, collectively, the three of us agreed that, that between myself, out of hours colleague and my secondary care colleague, and we started there to start planning on what we would do with the mosque. We've got a large hall and we've got 12 side rooms where the mosque uses these side rooms for madrasa classes for the children. And I engaged with the local acute hospital trust as well as the CCG. Now I had a constructive uh, discussion with the acute hospital trust, but interestingly, when I emailed the CCG, their response has been that there's no requirement for this additional capacity within mosques because we have a large acute hospital trust. We also have the GMX, which is similar to Excel in London when it's up and running. And they've also commissioned some rooms from the local private hospital for anybody who needs any surgical intervention. The preference of the CCG, which I would concur with, is that end of life patients should be catered for at home as far as possible. But in an Asian community where we have a high aging population with comorbidities including diabetes and heart problems it's very probable that either these elderly patients are going to be are going to struggle at home with the care that their families can provide or in light of the current national guidance around covid-19 if the end of life patient has coronavirus there may be times where the family after the lockdown is finished and not able to quarantine themselves for 14 days on the basis that they may have work commitments that they can't get out of. So there will be a number of um, scenarios where the local community feel that they need additional support and the local healthcare system may not be able to stretch that far. Now from the beginning we've agreed that this venture isn't just for Muslims, but it's for anybody of any faith within the community because we want the mosque to be seen as a community project, not just a Muslim project. So I then sent out a letter to the community from which, alhamdulillah, I've had over 60 applica uh, volunteer applications, many are GPs, pharmacists, opticians, dentists, nurses, but there's also non-clinical volunteers as well and this was very closely followed by donations both from the community and from businesses within the community which alhamdulillah we can use to purchase the equipment we need including beds defibrillators um, drugs trolleys and other things that we need now in line with what we want to deliver I have had a word with NHS England about the GP clinical negligence scheme, which is our national indemnity, government indemnity. And because this is a volunteer service and not necessarily a contract from the NHS, I just wanted to make sure that we were not leaving people, clinicians working within this service um, at risk by not having indemnity cover. So that's been quite a constructive discussion and we've uh, looked at a number of scenarios around honorary contracts of how we can ensure that clinicians working within the system have indemnity cover. And also I've engaged with the Care Quality Commission to make sure that we have the appropriate uh, registration in place to allow us to provide care. Now with this uh, model, this isn't about us as volunteers delivering the whole service, we'd be looking at 
the patients admitted into the service registering with one of the local GP practices to make engagement between the volunteers and the registered GP a lot easier. Um, and we'd be looking with for, we'd be looking to work with a local pharmacy as well. But what we would have is clinicians in between um, NHS visits so that we can monitor and support these end of life patients. So since the model started, and this was only two weeks ago when we had this discussion, it seems to have um, literally gone viral because we've been in the local press, the national press, we've had BBC radio on, um, we've got a request tomorrow for a TV interview. So within two weeks, Alhamdulillah, it's gone uh, quite far. And I've had calls now from Blackburn, Rochdale, other parts of the country where doctors are asking the question of how can they replicate a similar model in mosques that are closed within their towns and cities. And what I've said is that end of life may not be the model that each area wants to adopt, but it's for the local clinicians to work with the local health and social care system to decide what would best um, serve the local community. Now, in my scenario, clearly the CCG doesn't seem to be forthcoming, and we have one of two decision, decisions to make. One is we comply with the CCG and just accept the fact that hopefully Bolton has an adequate capacity to meet the needs of all our residents. And should the time come and we feel that there isn't adequate facility, then we may struggle to get our system up and running quickly enough. Or we take the alternative approach, which is the approach we're taking which is not to do any structural work to the hall, which could accommodate 30 to 40 beds, but to use the 12 side rooms that we have, which could comfortably accommodate 22 patients and start there. And should we get to a point where it's needed and we are at full capacity, then I have justification for going back to the commissioners to look for support to say we need to convert the hall into cubicles similar but probably not as expensive as what is happening at the Excel and will happen at the NEC and GMX and other venues around the country allowing us to expand the model further. We may find that one of the challenges are that volunteers don't want to work certain shifts. I suspect most of the volunteers who have day jobs may not want to work an overnight shift and therefore what I would need to do is commission that service from paid staff who can stay at the venue overnight monitoring those patients that are admitted into the facility. And that funding would come from the donations that we've already received. I have spoken to my federation. Um, my federation runs a homeless service. Um, we provide clinical NHS services to the homeless within a soup kitchen. And recently we have undergone a CQC inspection, which Alhamdulillah we've passed with no problems. So I've spoken to my federation to ask them to support this MOS project in ensuring that uh, I can be provided the adequate insight into what safeguards need to be in place, as well as filling in the paperwork and submitting it to CQC to make sure that um, this project is in the pipeline with the CQC. Also, one of the things that's happened recently is that nationally dentists, they've had their contracts frozen and have been advised to work with local COVID-19 hot hubs or hot sites. And my sister is a dentist in the local area and she's got staff who are quite familiar with infection control. So again, I've incorporated her staff into supporting us to ensure that anybody coming onto the premises are familiar with PPE and the safeguards they should be taking. And especially if we have any visitors, family members, then we make sure that they've adequately washed their hands and abide by the rules of the venture in terms of keeping their distance and wearing the PPE with um, suitable precautions. 
we're also looking because these are 12 separate rooms with their separate entrances and a window within the wall we're now exploring the feasibility of having technology so that people can zoom in from home and we can use iPads with the end of life patients for those that are able to engage so that at least they can talk to their family members without them having to come in to the mosque itself but on the odd occasion where people are the literally at the end of life and family immediate family members want to come and say their farewell we would support them by um, donning the appropriate PPE and then supporting them to actually make contact with their end of life uh, loved ones. So at the moment, we're at the point where I'm going through the bureaucratic steps of getting the registration, the indemnity, um, the funding, sourcing the beds, and working with other agencies before, inshallah, in the next week to two weeks, we start moving um, furniture and things into the venue so that we can be in a position to start taking people in, hopefully within two to three weeks from now. So that, in a nutshell, is the summary of the project that we initiated two weeks ago that seems to have uh, collected quite a lot of momentum. Don't, okay, don't, say, don't ask me to say all that again. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, exactly. I believe you should be able to see the questions on your screen. Please let me know if no. you can't. No, on my iPad, in... I can't see the question on my iPad. No, I've got, the, I've, I've got the poster, the National Mosque poster that you put up, the Nightingale Mosque poster. No um, problem. That's... Everyone who is in the chat, if you have any questions, please, if you could type them into the chat box. I'd just like to introduce uh, Dr. Arshad Latif, who is um, helping with the webinar. Um, he will be uh, just reading out some of the questions to, for Dr. Jeeva to answer. Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum, everybody, and Zakla uh, Dr. Mujiba, for uh, that brilliant presentation. MashaAllah, may Allah reward you immensely for uh, such a great work, MashaAllah, that you started. Um, so we've got a couple of questions uh, come in. Um, so first question is from Brother Muhammad Patel. Uh, he has asked, what type of clinical staff would you require for this kind of work? Well, in terms of the clinical staff, my staff, my staff, my staff, staff. In terms of the clinical staff, um, what I'm looking at doing is working with the local GP and local community services, which are the Macmillan nurses, district nurses. But depending on the demand on the system, we've got GPs, nurses who would help fill the gaps between NHS services attending. So it'd be, it's quite useful for me to have local GP colleagues who want to come and they'd be able to review the medication, review how much um, discomfort the patients may be in. And also for nurses who can monitor things like syringe drivers and uh, administer analgesia during the day. In terms of the non-clinical volunteers, I'm sure there'll be things where we need people to go and collect things for us or transport or we need people to um, engage with family members and pass on certain messages, not the clinical scenarios, but about meeting times and so forth. So I feel there's a, there's a, a place for everyone to have a role. Um, I just need to make sure that the place isn't overcrowded with volunteers throughout the day and night. Now, one of the things that I didn't mention, which I'm keen on looking at, is in the future, and this is when the lockdown is finished and the, the, the restrictions at the moment on distancing, social distancing, have been relaxed. Because we've got quite a large hall, I'm quite keen to use that. And we've got an on-site kitchen um, where wedding food is usually made, but we also have gusel facilities and you know all the other facilities we need for um, preparation before burial on site. But what I'm keen on is looking at the kitchen facility with our large hall, and inshallah, for those that are 70 and over in the future, make it into a social environment as well, where they can come in the morning, engage with clinicians and other community people, 
be fed coffee tea during the day and be able to go back home in the evening um, having had a day out of the house so again that's that's a, a, a branch to the main model but at the moment my priority is to get the main model which is the end of life side up and running um just like a low care um next question is uh, from dr abdullah Amawas. he's a consultant gastroenterologist at west suffolk hospital uh, he says um he bought a gp surge in colchester um and it had been closed and um, he mostly runs the three gp surgeries it's a huge phase um he says that because of the unprecedented time that we're facing he's more than happy to offer his two floors of the surgery which are 340 square meters each to nhs use to make make to to use it as a makeshift center for covid free of charge um so he's basically asking can i do this um and uh who should he approach if you want to provide your premises for free um, the people to usually approach would be your ccg and i'm sure they'll have a pandemic covid19 group across the borough which engages engages the acute trust the council as well as as well as other agencies i know like in bolton amir khan the boxer has volunteered his uh wedding hall here which is quite a large venue i've already had a venue which if i'm right is 200,000 square foot i'm talking a factory on three or four floors with its own large car parking area but at the end of the day we have to ask the question about what is physically doable for us and for me as a full-time gp working with my lmc and federation jobs as well we have to keep a project that is deliverable because although i'm running the project here in bolton with the support of my colleagues in different parts of the country we have to have clinicians who are going to take leadership in running that project and it's not something that one individual could run around the country so offering the premises is great and i suspect that each ccg across the country has already had discussions around what premises are available and it may be that these premises in manchester may be used as a hot hub for the local gp practices and the ccg may find that quite useful on the other hand they may already have made provisions in which case the question you've got to ask is are you donating the premises for a time limited period to the nhs for them to use it however way they want to use it or are you looking at those premises to be used in a community volunteer type of model which is what we're doing to say that we want to work in partnership with the nhs but it's run by us okay, exactly okay, i hope uh, that answer your question um so the next one is from brother adnan ali he basically wants to know a bit more about CQC registration, how did you get around it? Well, how would we, the um, chief inspector, and it's the inspector that I have at my GP surgery, who is also the inspector for my GP federation. And I had a discussion with her um, and it shared the fact that we're not planning to do any testing or any invasive stuff. This is about supervising and supporting end of life patients. So what they've said is that we need to fill in the main registration form. Um, I am the nominated manager for my GP surgery. So there's no reason why I can't be the manager also for this project. And as I said, the key individual that helped my GP federation with the paperwork to get um, CQC registration for our homeless service is the person I've approached to help us fill the paperwork in for this. With the COVID-19 situation, I don't see many places actually getting a CQC visit this year anyway. And what I have been advised is that if you're filling in a CQC uh, registration form, you must put on top of it COVID-19 so that that form is fast-tracked by CQC to ensure that you get the appropriate approval for your project to go further. What they did say is that you don't have to wait for the CQC registration before you start the project. You can start working on the project as long as your paperwork is in the pipeline. 
notified. So you can start uh, working on the project. Um, is the is the simple reply? Right. Okay. Um, uh, the Medib um, asked a very interesting question. I'm, I'm not sure whether it's a clinical one, but um, there have been examples in previous outbreaks, for example, Ebola, uh, where survivors uh, who are then hence immune were able to provide care for patients, um, especially end of life care. Has this been considered at all in this model? For Ebola patients. I'm not sure Ebola is going to. Yeah, he's, he's, he's referring to Ebola. Um, I, I'm not. I don't have much knowledge about that. Um, but um, apparently, Ebola survivors, um, because they had been exposed to Ebola, were of course immune. Um, yeah. And they, the they were then. The problem we have is that only last weekend have we started getting access to swabbing in the community at a Greater Manchester level. And I know each LMC, including mine has been given allocated slots um, from Saturday last weekend for patients, or not patients, but staff within general practice to be swabbed. Now the swabbing will work quite well if the person having the swab done is unwell at that time. What it's not gonna tell us if, is if somebody's had the infection a few weeks ago, and unfortunately at the moment, the antibody test isn't available to find out who's already got immunity. There is still this issue of once you've had COVID-19 and you develop the antibodies, is that a one-off or is there a risk that you might get the infection again? And I've yet to hear definitive answer nationally that getting it once gives you lifetime immunity. So in the absence of a test that we could undertake for all the clinical staff to decide whether they've already got the antibodies and therefore they would be at less risk looking after COVID-19 patients, we have to assume that none of us have had COVID-19 and done the appropriate PPE to ensure that we don't catch it from the patients and likewise, we don't give it to the patients either. Okay, um, there've been a number of questions as expected about PPE, um, I, I, I'm, getting this all the time from our local funeral directors, uh, especially uh, for burials for whistle. Um, so here, uh, it's of course more for the clinicians. Uh, so it's a question from uh, one of the sisters here is, Nadia Khan, would you be able to get a sustainable supply of PPE when there is a shortage already there? Um, and there's some other question about PPE as well. Um, Okay, sorry, I've lost that the question. So yeah, if you can answer that, please, first. Well, like a lot of GPs around the country, I have doubts about the government issuing of PPE. From the beginning, we've had a view that the fluid repellent surgical masks are inadequate for primary care. And the, G the national government uh, approach has been that FFP3 is only for aerosol type procedures within a hospital setting. The apron are flimsy um, and are felt to be inadequate and we've got gloves. Only recently has the government changed its uh, national guidance on PPE within the community and added in um, visors for primary care. Now, although the government is saying that um, PPE is being distributed in its millions, uh, most of the listeners will probably know that there's been a, a recent outcry nationally that practices were getting fluid repellent surgical masks that were four years out of date. And when and, and the sticker for 2016 was, there was another sticker put on top to say that they are valid until 2020. Now, when we questioned that with the national team, they said that the fluid these fluid repellent surgical masks have been retested and are still suitable now beyond the ex previous expiry date of 2016 and are still um, good to use now. Um, I, I feel a lot of GPs are still cynical about using um, surgical masks alone. Myself, I'm cynical. So what I've tended to do, and, and you'll, you'll be surprised, you won't be surprised to know that uh, dentists have been getting surgical masks um, with expiry dates of 2024, um, and that's because they buy their masks from uh, their suppliers. 
and even recently i've bought a fair number of ffp3 masks and n95 masks off amazon so they are available but as demand has gone up the timeline to get a stock of these masks has gone up and i suspect that if you ordered some off amazon or somewhere else now you may be looking at middle of may to late may before you get your supply in terms of the national stuff my my approach at the moment has been and for those of you that can see the webcam you'll notice that i have got a beard and i've no intention of shaving my beard off like my hospital colleagues who have been asked to shave their beards off so that they can get fit tested with an ffp3 mask but my approach has been to use either an ffp3 mask or an n95 mask but put on top of it the surgical masks that were being provided by the government the reason for that is that after i've seen a patient it is easier and cheaper for me to discard the surgical mask on each occasion than to try getting hold of um, ffp3 masks for every patient that i'm seeing so although the government is suggesting the surgical mask is adequate i'm putting an ffp3 mask underneath it for my own protection and then discarding the surgical mask that's on the surface now we've already had a call only two days ago from a charity in dewsbury and alhamdulillah they're a national and an international charity that's been helping a lot of their local schools um, gp surgeries and so forth they heard about this project and they have offered to provide us all the ppe we need for this project and any other support we may need in the uh, foreseeable future so the the funding the donations will help plus donations of ppe from the community from these kind of charities is really welcomed as well well while we're on that topic uh, dr jeeva i mean where do you see the main challenge is it in the supply chain or um, where do you feel is the main issue with ppe <laughs> For me, the main issue, and I, I logged on to the NHS England webinar recently, about a week ago as well, which was stemmed around PPE. And my main issue, which is echoed by a lot of my LMC colleagues, is that the whole government drive seems to be around secondary care PPE being their priority. And I think they've overlooked primary care, which in effect is the front line to managing patients in the community who have COVID-19. And without an adequate, without adequate engagement from primary care, a lot of these patients are gonna end up in secondary care anyway, and the secondary care system is gonna be flooded and they're not gonna be able to cope. So my view is that the government is highly prioritizing secondary care PPE and not giving enough importance to primary care PPE which is holding a lot of clinicians in primary care back from engaging with hot sites where COVID-19 patients are referred to, care homes where patients, where clinicians are being asked to do care home visits, um, and also doing home visits. Yeah. Okay, um, uh, let's move on to uh, mainly the work that you're doing. I mean, I, I know we can go on and on on PPE today, and there are a number of other questions on PPE, so I, I apologize. I think we have to just leave it there because Dr. Jeeva is here mainly to discuss about the, uh, the Marshall, the, the Nottingham Mosques project that he started. Um, and a lot of people are asking about how they can scale it up and how they can contribute. So there's a question from Brother Muhammad Atta. Um, He's from Al Huda, uh, and he says they've got five to six uh, rooms in their basement area. However, they're all, all the rooms are carpeted. Could this be a problem? Well, the mosque rooms that we've got are carpeted as well. Um, if you go into care homes, there are still care homes around that have carpets in patient rooms, although I accept that CQC would prefer to have lino. So what we're planning to do, and because the, eventually when the project finishes and when the COVID-19 national position settles down possibly in 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 months time, we need to give these premises back to our mosque so that they can function as madrasas as well. What we're planning to do is to get lino on top of the carpet and secure that down so that the carpet underneath is protected but it's also easier for, for us to keep the, loo, the rooms clean um, and hygienic. 
So we're going to cover the carpets with lino. Right. Okay. Excellent. Right. Um, much other questions uh, keep on coming. Um, so basically, um, it, it, it's more about how do you get this service registered? I mean, are you registering it as a new service like the nursing home? Or are you tagging in onto somebody else in CQC's registration? Is it, uh, I mean, it's, it's more about a registration question, really. You could do either. I'm registering it as a new service because it's within a mosque and it is a new service. And I suspect in 12 months time, I won't need to carry on registering with CQC because we'll have dismantled it. But if you have got, for example, you may have an out of hours service locally and the CCG may support your local hours uh, NHS contract to be expanded to include your project as well. In which case the out of hours services CQC registration may incorporate this project for a time limited period. So you could do either. The starting point really should be for the clinicians to have a discussion with your community members and the mosque committee or school committee, wherever you're going to use the premises, get some idea about what kind of service do you want to offer the community. And once you've got an idea to engage with your local CCG to say this is what you would like to do, are they willing to engage and what options are available to you to make that vision a reality? Okay, um, uh, Salman has been receiving a few questions. So over to you now, Salman. Thank you. Um, it's just coming back to, to the workforce. I mean, you mentioned um, uh, general practitioners and, and nursing colleagues. Um, what uh, some questions are coming through about uh, what is the role of um, the palliative care teams? I think you mentioned that. What, what sort of buy-in is there from the palliative care team? Um, that's that's one aspect of it. But what about sort of our pharmacy colleagues? You mentioned your sister's a dentist uh, and the dental workforce. Uh, what about the hospital-based clinicians? Um, how how can they sort of be involved in an initiative like this or advocate for it? Because people are asking, does it have to come from the GPs and the CCGs? Well, it, it depends on what the model you want to adopt is. Now, originally, when we had a when we were planning this, our vision was to try and help a step down service rather than a step up service. And the idea of my cousin being a consultant on MAU at our local acute hospital trust meant that patients who who had COVID type symptoms that were bed blocking in the acute hospital trust, uh, meaning they've got no capacity, could have been stepped down into our facility to free up those beds who can have more active treatment. In terms of, and that's that's going to be difficult in the short term for us to adopt because the CCG isn't supportive in the Bolton area. Um, that's where we then went up to a step up approach instead. In terms of the different clinicians that are available, in terms of dentists and my sister's staff, they'd be quite valuable in terms of, in effect, manning the door so that they can show people as they come in how you should wash your hands and then help them put the gown on, the masks on, the gloves on and so forth. And when they're going out to make sure that the kind of PPE is taken off in the right order and that they wash their hands properly before they leave the premises. And they can lead on infection control. In terms of pharmacy, we can use their services in terms of making sure that we have an adequate supply of drugs and that they bridge the service between us and the registered GP and also look at the medication that the patient is on because end of life you know all the all the medication that people are on they don't need all that medication and some of it like statins for example may not be required when somebody's got a few weeks of life left in them so at least the pharmacist can help us with polypharmacy and how to reduce it to what is really necessary. Um, GPs and nurses have a straightforward role. In terms of Macmillan nurses and district nurses, the approach I'm taking is that these 22 residents that are within the mosque, if we weren't there, would have been in their own homes and they would be, ex they would be receiving the same clinical service from community providers that I'll be expecting. 
in fact it makes it easier for those clinical services because instead of going to 22 different homes and spending half the time on the road what we're doing is bringing them all together under one roof so it's easier for the Macmillan and district nurses to see all the patients within one roof rather than having to spend their time on the road so there's a place for most people there may be people that other clinicians that have put themselves forward that I can't think of a role, a direct role for at the moment, example an optician, but it's the fact that they've genuinely offered their time for a community service which is appreciated and inshallah if there's, um, th th there's a void in our service that could be filled by an optician or another clinical colleague then we have their details and we can call on them. Thank you. And just just quickly, one more thing. Someone's asked about spiritual care. Um, have have you obviously it's a, it's a it is a mosque, but as you mentioned, it's for for people of of, of all backgrounds. Um, are you incorporating any elements of spiritual care and chaplaincy into the service? For for us, um, what we're planning to do is that because each of the rooms, some of the rooms are larger than others and can accommodate four beds very comfortably. Most rooms can accommodate two beds. And what I would be looking to do is, as far as possible, try and keep the Muslims in one room, Christians in one room, Hindus in one room, so that yesterday I had an offer from my niece, and she's got a colleague who is offering small tablets where the tablet kind of, it's a cube, a Quran cube, I think she called it, which recites the Quran and plays it back to you. And for me, I think, for an end-of-life Muslim, there's some blessing and comfort in listening to the Quran um, in your final days, weeks, and hours. So I'd be looking at doing something like that for the Muslim uh, patients that are admitted. In terms of other faiths, we'd be welcoming their religious, spiritual um, priest, vicars um, into the venue so that they can provide comfort to their own. Um, community. So yes, we will be adopting a spiritual element to this because for those that do have a belief, that's quite an important um, endpoint um, in in passing from one life to another. Thank you. This is a question about funding. So someone's asked about uh, at the moment you're reliant on voluntary funding. Um, um, would every willing mosque have to arrange for a substantial long period of care as it could be discontinued at short notice and how could they overcome that? Well in my project I've initially asked for £50,000 to buy the equipment and services and other bits that I need. I went to see an elderly couple in my community today because their GP can't get out to them and these are people who have seen me from a, a baby grow up um, to this age and I went to see them and this elderly gentleman's donated a thousand pounds and I'm talking somebody who's in, in, in their late 70s early 80s if not older so people have donated very very generously mashallah and should we need more funding moving forward I'm comfortable that our community will offer that additional funding the bit we have to be careful of is that when we're asking for government funding from CCGs and other agencies there is a fair bit of bureaucracy and business cases and things that you need to adopt and for that you need to also engage in delivering the KPIs and feedback and so forth and the question for me was how bureaucratic do we make this service when we know that COVID-19 is here and the peak is weeks away not even months away so I really don't have that much time to be filling in loads of business cases and paperwork to try and get some support and then be micromanaged by NHS commissioners on what we're doing, how we're doing it and feeding back with reports when really I should be spending my time with the patients um, providing whatever comfort I can. So if you can get the support from your local commissioners, that's great and it may be non-recurrent funding you're looking for because inshallah the COVID-19 issue is a time limited issue but I think if you have the right concept and the right intention and you discuss it with your community leaders, I'm sure in every area 
your community will come to your call, including the business people in that area as well. Just on that point, you mentioned you know six to twelve months. Um, is, is that the sort of time frame that you put in and other facilities and other communities should be looking to tie up any facilities uh, into something like this? Or did you consider shorter term or even longer term sort of making the facility into a permanent residential facility? Uh, are those things being discussed? Well, I'm working on the basis that the initial peak for COVID-19 is weeks away, if not a month at the most. But from what I understand, we're going to be getting a second peak somewhere around October this year as well. So when we discussed this project, we didn't see the merit of doing it for this first peak and then dismantling the whole project, only to find that we've got to um, readapt everything come winter this year. So we're working on the basis of running this through to January. Depending on what the premises are used for in other parts of the country, this may be the beginning of a long-term project where you may want to support end-of-life patients or COVID-19 patients. But moving on, once this is settled down, you may want to provide facilities for the elderly in your community that struggle to look after themselves at home. So I think it's going to vary depending on what, fun, what premises you've got, what funding you've got, and crucially, what's the service you're providing? Because some of this may be may not be end of life. There may be day centres where people can come just for the day and then go back to their homes in the evening. So it really depends on what project you want to do as to how long you need to run it for. Absolutely. And I think on that point, I uh, should refer people to the Muslim Council of Britain's report on end of life in Muslim communities, which uh, highlights the fact that we are, uh, inshallah, when COVID is over in the years to come, ending in a situation where more Muslim families with dementia and long-term conditions will need uh, culturally appropriate facilities. So this could be a catalyst for the community to uh, have Muslim hospices or Muslim uh, residential care uh, set up in the areas. And as you mentioned, not just end of life, but also respite, uh, people who are medically fit for discharge and, and so on. Um, just um, a few questions here about in, in your particular case for end of life. Um, someone's asking about uh, oxygen provision. I presume you won't be providing medical treatment to that level, if I'm, if I'm correct. We won't have ventilators, but I have recently just received an email uh, from a company, I think it's down in London, and it's a charity who can provide oxygen. So I'll be engaging with that charity to see what their terms and conditions are in terms of getting the provision. But yes, if we can get oxygen on site, then I'd be happy to use oxygen to provide comfort for those that are struggling um, with breathing. But that's probably as far as we would go. We would, we, we've no intention of having, having anything at the level of a ventilator bed, because clearly these are end of life patients. So I think just the final few questions, and they're all similar before we, we wrap up. Um, it's predominantly around the governance. So I assume that you know you you put a lot of work into. We know you put a lot of work into this, and have um, clearly made some very um, strong progress. Are there frameworks? Are there things like checklists uh, or a pack or something that uh, could be put together or shared with other? Um, facilities or other initiatives that that uh, they could take forward and get that two-week head start that you have already uh, put up um, for them to take forward? Is that something that you would be in a position to share? Uh, in a word, there isn't. And a lot of what we're doing now is because of my experience in my other jobs in the LMC and the Federation, which has helped me to understand the hurdles that we need to jump to get to get to where we are now. Um, I've not written anything down at that level of what needs doing because clearly at the moment um, I'm racing against time to get this one facility up and running. And this is the reason why I didn't take on the factory and a number of other venues that I was offered in Bolton because I haven't got the time to be taking on four or five facilities I'd rather just get the one up and running and do it properly. What I have said, 
and I think there is merit in it, is since the COVID-19 issue has come along, and as most of the listeners will know, the number of meetings that we've had face-to-face have dropped to literally zero now. And we're using a lot of uh, video conferencing platforms like Starleaf and Zoom and other platforms, AccuRx, which has really made life a lot easier. So one of the things I was going to offer to Beamer, if Beamer wanted to facilitate this, was that if there are clinicians who are leading or want to lead a project in their part of the country, whether it's a school, mosque or anything else, then on a regular basis, we can set up a video conference call so that we can collectively share what we've learned, what obstacles we've faced and what solutions are there. And I can bring in colleagues who are in management positions, GPs who are in management positions, who can bring a different perspective on some of the challenges that some of you may be facing to get get over uh, the bureaucratic steps. So yeah, I'd be I'd be keen to work with colleagues around the country in a video conference call on a regular basis to see what progress we're making, and inshallah, collectively we can have a model that's across the country. Jazakallah khair. I think uh, that's a perfect note uh, on which to to end. Uh, if people did want to um, consider that, take up uh, Dr. Jeeva's offer on that. If you could email us at covid c o v i d at british i m a dot org, um, and then we can collate your details and uh, uh, take up um, communicate with Dr. Jeeva a time. Um, through which we can communicate. I've just got a very quick question or rather a comment that's come in from uh, um, one of the scholars, uh, uh, Sheikh Osman um, um, Maravia, who mentions that zakat could also be used for funding uh, for facilities like these. Um, and of course, I'd leave that to individuals to discuss with their scholars and uh, zakat institutions about taking up that offer. Uh, Dr. Jeeva, Jazakumullah khair. Thank you so much for your time. It's really appreciated. And I'll reward you and your community for the wonderful facility that you will be bringing, not just to the Muslims, but for everyone uh, in your area. And may it be a source of um, ajr for you, your family and your communities. Is there any concluding comments that you'd like to make for, for attendees to take away? We're all busy and we've all got day jobs. But this is the one time where the health and social care system, I don't feel, is going to be adequate anywhere in the country. And this is really the time where the community should step forward. So make the right intention. Inshallah, you'll be supported from a spiritual and worldly perspective. And just drive it forward and let's deliver on it. Thank you all for attending. Uh, inshallah this video will be uploaded shortly uh, onto YouTube. Uh, please do join BMA at britishrma.org forward slash join if you haven't already and we hope that those of you who are able to take this up can email us and we can inshallah bring many more Nightingale mosques to join Mashad Rosia uh, in the future. Assalamu alaikum. Have a good evening. Okay,